Yeah, I think you I'm ready? ready. Are you ready? You ready? Ready. 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 Hello, welcome to Bookworms. It's the show where we read a book and then talk about that book. I'm your host, Alex. And I'm Joe. And oh boy, oh boy, do we have a book for you guys today, baby. That's just sad. <laughs> <laughs> it is very sad. Oh, I just got done crying about it, and now we're going to talk about it. Your your, your puns are uh, falling flat, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what book do we got, Alex? Uh, our book today, we are discussing a mystery thriller for the ages. It is Gone Baby Gone by Dennis Lehane. And this was your pick, wasn't it? It was. And this was a blind pick. You had not read it before. As I found out after I started uh, telling you important plot points and you having saying, oh, I haven't, you know, I'm not there yet. Not understanding that you hadn't actually, because all the books I picked, I've read already. And I thought that was what we were doing here, but apparently not. Yeah, this is the only book out of all the ones I chose that I hadn't read yet. So I had read other Dennis Lehane books, including the first three books in the Kenzie and Gennaro series and uh, his book Mystic River. I really enjoyed all of them. And uh, Gone Baby Gone, it's one of, the, one of his better known books, mostly because of the Ben Affleck movie. Um, and just, he's uh, the, the writer, Dennis Lehane, he's really good at coming up with moral dilemmas, really in all the stories that I've read of his and presenting, you know, these, it's not just good guy, bad guy, it's, you know, bad guy, worse guy, or, guy who's doing uh, the wrong thing for the right reasons versus the guy who's doing the right thing for the right reasons, but it's also a bad thing for a lot of people that are trying to do the right thing, which makes a lot of sense. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> so what, So you picked it because it was the next one in the series for you, and you're just like, sure, let's go with it. Yeah, I, I uh, had a strong hunch that I was going to enjoy it. I had a general idea of what the book was going to be about, and uh, I'd also read other books in the series, so I felt pretty comfortable picking it up and being able to kind of tear it apart. And I don't know, I felt like a uh, I felt like a distant relative when I was reading it. And for those that hadn't read the first three books, and you were worried about it, did they have to read those books before they read this one? No, like a lot of detective fiction, a lot of those are serialized stories. Like, I don't know, there's like a million Jack Reacher books. You don't need to read every single one to understand. And you book 26, uh, you can pick up book 26 and read book 26, and it makes sense because it's a self contained story. Uh, Gone Baby Gone is similar to that. That's a very common thing you find in this genre because the, uh, you know, these stories are supposed to be, you know, flying off the shelves. And if you have to read through three books to get to one book for it to make sense, uh, you're not going to buy it. So you got to make sure each one can be a standalone. And Gone Baby Gone does build off of the other three books. I thought all the references to the other books were explained enough and you could kind of go through and not be lost. You said you felt otherwise, though, because you had not read the other three Yeah, three, I had not read the other books. books. And, I mean, he gave plenty of detail, but a lot of it was just like... Wow, I, I, I am missing a lot of the backstory for the two main characters here and a couple of the other characters that pop in and out. And, you know, it, it made sense, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I am clearly missing some key drama here that would you know make things all the more uh, lucid. Yeah, I think the biggest issue is the character development you see in um, A Drink Before the War and and the second one and the third book, Sacred, is um, from the beginning of A Drink Before the War, it, they're very different characters to when you get to Gone Baby Gone because you know they're private investigators. Uh, in the beginning of this stor huge story arc, uh, Angela Gennaro is married to an abusive husband. Uh, Patrick Kenzie is her, like first you know first love ever but they've managed to stay friends uh beyond that and things grow and th and a bunch of really really bad stuff happens a lot of morally questionable stuff happens angela gennaro uh becomes a widow and she starts dating patrick and uh, they become like a the most power couple of the private investigation industry and they also had to do things like fight a serial killer and um they expo do things like expose 
massive amounts of political corruption. Like in the first book, they tie, manage to tie uh, political candidates with street level drug trade. And that's kind of like a constant theme throughout the book also is they always have like a simple mission or simple, they're hired for a very simple reason. And it always blows up into these massive conspiracies, which is kind of fun because like they were hired to find a missing maid and drink before the war and they wind up in the middle of this massive drug trade and all of these things about, you know, political blackmail and this whole nightmare scenario. And they end up like flat out executing a dude. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Sounds it. Um, you know, after reading this, I'm definitely going to pick up the first three books and read them eventually. So I, I did enjoy it enough to do that. Yeah. And there's uh, uh, there's two more books after gone baby gone. Yeah. So I saw that I'm looking too. forward to. And what, what other books did, uh, Lehane, right? Uh, so he's, uh, you know, his three best known books are probably best known because they're also movies. Uh, he wrote the book Mystic River, uh, which uh, became a very notable like, movie starring Sean Penn, um, who, I don't, know, I don't know why we haven't covered a Sean Penn book, but uh, we could have a lot of fun with that. Uh, but yeah, Mystic River, excellent book. Uh, he also wrote a, a book called Shutter Island, which became a Scorsese film with Leo in it. That was a good one. I like that movie. Yeah, it's a fun one. I have not watched Mystic River. I haven't either. I should, though. The story's really cool. So this book was written in the 90s, and it reads like it was in the 90s. You know, me and Alex were just talking before we hit record how every once in a while they'd be like, why don't they just go hop on their cell phone? Oh, yeah, that's right. There were no cell phones. <laughs> the, one, the ones you had were good for about like three feet away from whoever you were trying to call. You, you were basically better off just yelling at them than uh, you had those, you had those antennas that you phone. had to pull out. So, but yeah, so it, yeah, it would be a little jarring at times because you'd be like, you know, why are we going through all these extra steps? Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, this is yeah. in a different different time. Yeah, he's got to run to find a payphone so that he can call the police chief. And actually having to remember numbers. Yeah, whipping out the Rolodex. Yeah. People are smoking inside. Yeah, that was that was another one. I was like, oh, yeah, that used to be allowed in Boston <laughs> until <laughs> re- relatively recently even. Yeah, like I grew up in the 90s. Like I remember like – They'd always ask, like, at a restaurant, like, smoking or non-smoking. And then they put you in the same section anyways. Yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's all the same. <laughs> Everything just reeked of stale cigarettes. It was great. Yeah. Man, those it's, the it's days. nostalgic whenever I smell it now. It's like, <laughs> man, those were the good old days where your children couldn't breathe. And <laughs> all right, well, speaking of children who can't breathe, let's get into Gone Baby Gone. Yeah, you want to read the... The back cover there, Alex. What a so people know what they're getting into here. Uh, should I uh, should I na- uh, pronounce the name of the city correctly? I don't know. Can you? The tough neighborhood of Dorchester is. <laughs> na- oh, <laughs> Dorchester. <laughs> Dorchester. <laughs> As you said, the locals. Because <laughs> you know we're we're in New Hampshire, so we're we're like them, but better. Uh, we're, we're we're above them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the tough neighborhood of Dorchester is no place for the innocent or the weak. Its territory is defined by hard heads and even harder luck. Its streets are littered with the detritus of broken families, hearts, dreams. Now, one of its youngest is missing. Private investigators Patrick Kenzie and Angela Gennaro don't want the case. But after pleas from the child's aunt, they open an investigation that will ultimately risk everything, their relationship, their sanity, and even their lives to find a little girl lost. Oh boy, starting off heavy. Yeah, missing children is always a bad one. Yeah, this one is uh, it's got a lot of emotional weight to it. Really, like anytime you want, I don't know, it always hits me in the feels whenever like a story involves violence against children. So, and it's already you know, the, even from the very beginning, it starts tugging at the heartstrings and. It it really builds throughout, like almost to the point where I got I don't know, I'm gonna spoil my some of my review at the end. Uh, it gets a little it gets a little ridiculous at the end. Where I'm, well, I'll just go out and say that. Well, you know, it could be just like me who usually spoils the whole story within the first five minutes of our podcast. So you yeah. just re- re- spoiling your review is no big deal, Alex. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Rosebud is uh, the sled. So yeah, it, it starts off kind of weird because you get this picture not in Dorchester. Yeah, it's a uh, flash forward all the way forward into the far future of 1998. Yeah, and Texas. Uh, you, you get yeah, in Texas, and you get this woman that wants to make no friends and have, you know, doesn't want to talk to anyone and adores her child. 
And that's basically what that is. Yep, it's just uh, just this mystery woman. She, everyone's obsessed with her due to her uh, due to her beauty. I mean, it is Texas. I mean, how many of them, uh, you know, basically marry their cousins? Yeah, we shouldn't say that because we got two listeners in Texas. I think so. <laughs> don't don't do think, stop listening. Do you think they're cousins? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's West Virginia. They don't have <laughs> listeners in West Virginia, right? I don't think so. Okay, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> they don't read. Me. So yeah, then we uh, jump forward. Into yeah. the boss, greater Boston area. Yeah, and by jumping forward, we, it means we go back one full year to 1997. And the book opens with uh, something that is really engaging to the reader. It opens with statistics. Oh, boy. Yeah. And these are statistics about child abductions. Yeah, keep starting it off hard. Uh, so, yeah, the, after you get to the prologue, you get to part one, Indian Summer 1997, and the opening line is, each day in this country, 2,300 children are reported missing. Uh, so better than uh, waking up in a bathtub? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, which bathtubs come into play later on. Uh, but, yeah, there's just like a, it's a solid page. It just um, it kind of breaks down those 2,300 children into smaller quadrants. I could, I'll read the whole thing. Of those, a large portion are abducted by one parent estranged from the other, and over 50% of the time, the child's whereabouts are never in question. The majority of these children are returned within a week. Another portion of these 2,300 children are runaways. Again, the majority of them are not gone long, and usually their whereabouts are either known immediately or easily ascertained. A friend's house is the most common destination. Another category of missing children is the throwaway, those who are cast out of their homes or who run away, and the parents decide not to give chase. They are often the children who fill shelters and bus terminals, street corners, and the red lights district, and ultimately prisons. Of the more than 800,000 children reported missing nationally every year, only 3,500 to 4,000 fall into what the Department of Justice categorizes as non-family abductions, or cases in which the police soon rule out family abductions, running away, parental ejection, or the child becoming lost or injured. Of these cases, 300 children disappear every year and never return. No one, not parents, friends, law enforcement, child care organizations, or centers for missing people, knows where these children go. Into graves, possibly. Into cellars, or the homes of pedophiles. Into voids. Perhaps holes in the fabric of the universe where they will never be heard from again. Wherever these 300 go, they stay gone. For a moment or two, they haunt strangers who've never heard their cases. Haunt their loved ones for far longer. Without a body to leave behind, proof of their passing, they don't die. They keep us aware of the void, and they stay gone. That is your public service announcement for the day. <laughs> Alex, I don't think you got hired for the part to do the audio book, but good wow. job. Man, that was, that was pretty good. That was, I did that uh, unre unrehearsed. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like it starts off, you know, like it's all like, you know, it's being like, oh, yeah, like obviously like most abduction cases are going to be family related. It's going to be just more of like a domestic squabble. But then it gets heavier and heavier and heavier until you get to the really dark stuff. And like in that just one page of text, it's kind of like sets up the entire structure of this book where, you know, it's, it starts off lighter and then it gets, you know, by the time you get to the end, it's about as dark as can be. Even though we find out in the end that the child that they're looking for is actually one of those domestic situations, it's, uh, they're, they're still led throughout that entire journey of child abduction that we just read. Yeah. Um, so as soon as we get through that, we're introduced to our two protagonists. And we also get the aunt and uncle who are trying to find the missing child and trying to hire our private detectives. Kenzie and Gennaro, uh, they don't want to take this case at first. Because, because they got trauma. Yeah. And, they, and they, they, they've taken up uh, finding lost dogs and pulling cats out of trees to doing hard c cases and usually their rule of thumb was no children because they always end up bad yeah they are uh they're still dealing with repercussions especially from like the second book 
uh, where they where they both almost died and someone that they were close to wound up being a serial killer and uh, like that's the book where uh, uh, Gennaro loses her husband and you know it's, it's a really traumatic event for them but it also turns them into like local celebrities so their business starts exploding but they're just not capable of handling any more emotional trauma so they're taking the fluff cases and it's, everything kind of starts off fishy because it feels like people that are you know let's get said it's the uncle and aunt that are trying to hire them not the mother of the child that's missing and we find out quickly that the mother's kind of a bum yeah so um i think they're almost ch- like Uncle Lionel and oh god, what's the aunt's name? Is it Beatrice or something? Yeah, Aunt Beatrice. Uh, they're trying to keep Lionel's sister Helene like out of the investigation portion, which is weird because you know Helene is the mother and like she's been on the news a few times and she's like fame like now become like a locally known for you know screaming her head off and being very wild when the camera's pointed at her. Uh, however, when they meet her for the first time, they get a much different perspective of her. Just a drunk that wants to watch daytime TV. Yeah, basically, uh, she's uh, she's strung <laughs> out. They uh, yeah, they waste no time in uh, portraying uh, the missing girl Amanda, uh, their Amanda's mother, as being drunk, neglectful, and uh, kind of one of the direct causes for why the child is missing because she. Her story is she went to her neighbor's house to watch TV, and she left her door unlocked, and someone came in and took the kid. Only to find out later that she wasn't even in the building. Yep, she was. Uh, she went down to the local bar to hang out with her friends there, and was well, gone. That, that was the next story that she actually wasn't even there. Yeah, they find out. Yep. So she so was gone yeah, for be, four as we get hours deeper and like deeper, that. it got just more and more complicated. At, you know how much how neglectful she actually was, how much how little attention she actually gave to the kid uh, taking the kid to the bars all the time while she was trying to get drunk and score drugs though. I mean, this is the nineties people you have to remember taking your kids to the bars wasn't completely out of the question back in the day. Yeah. Like, yeah. Lean took Amanda like on a, uh, on a, like to do a drug deal also. And like, he's always putting her in dangerous situations and when she's not putting her in dangerous situations she's just being neglectful and ignored and put in front of the tv and told not to bother her so yeah so the our protagonists uh decide not to take the case but they still do case research just because it's kind of one of those nagging things like oh you know how can we not look for this missing kid it's a it's a young kid you know why wouldn't we put in every effort just to see if there's anything that just kind of pops out to us. Yeah, they do an initial search, and they realize that you know the people that Helene is involved with are not good people, and that if they they realize if they investigate this case, they're probably going to be similar to their other cases where they are pulled into some deep, seedy areas where bad stuff is going to probably happen. And they don't want to. They don't want any part of it at first. But Kenzie's one of those bulldogs. Once he catches a scent, he can't just let go of it. Gennaro, uh, you know, she's she can be tough as nails, but she's also uh, got a soft spot, especially for children. And eventually, the aunt convinces them to take the case. And th- that was one strange thing because they kept playing up um, Gennaro's uh, like maternal instincts. maternal instincts, and you know, it just, it just seemed off for her character at least in today's kind of view of it like where you know she she never really wanted a kid but all of a sudden a missing girl comes in and all of a sudden it's like i gotta have children right now and if it felt said it didn't it felt forced yeah there's one criticism i have of this book gennaro in the first three books is much more like fleshed out like all of her character development happens in those first three books this one uh, i i hate to call her like a stagnant character but I feel like she's underutilized. This is very. This is a very Patrick heavy book. I know he's like the narrator of the story and everything, but he's often doing things, and she's more like in the background or on the outskirts of that. So that was, that was one criticism I had. Of the book was uh, not enough Angela, and when she was there, it's more just to provide those. Uh, uh, I keep awkward moments. Yeah, awkward moments, moral dilemmas. Uh, the you know 
playing the arguing the other side of whatever uh, whatever they're trying to say is the right thing to do. Uh, playing devil's advocate. And then we uh, we start getting into some uh, some really complex and confusing stuff because uh, they're. They team up with two police officers, uh, one Broussard and Poole. Yeah, they were uh, told to meet up with them by the sergeant of the uh, missing children's department for yeah. the Boston PD. Yes, the CAC. Um, the CAC. The CAC. <laughs> but then they, uh, uh, so Broussard and Poole, uh, they're older police officers. Uh, that, that sergeant's going to come in important later, by the way. Just, just FYI. Yeah. If you haven't read the book. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, for being like seasoned police officers, they're doing, they choose to do some shady things. Like they find out that Helene had stolen $200,000 from a drug dealer whose name strikes fear into the hearts of everyone in the Dorchester area. His name is Cheese. And so they immediately link Cheese to the kidnapping. Uh, however, Poole and Broussard, rather than report the money that they find, they they decide to just keep it under the table and do this not by the book and just offer a full entree two hundred thousand dollars for Amanda. Yeah, this it kind of comes off as very training day. Just the the way that they cre- you know, create these situations, you know, almost dirty cop situations. But you, you can almost justify, yeah, they're doing it for the greater good because missing children. We can't you know can't let these nasty things happen to these kids we don't want a dead child or a tortured child yeah they just want to handle this as fast as possible get the kid back and move on with their day i said the whole time you kind of got like that sour feeling and got like like something something just extra off from all this so yeah they they they, we meet cheese who seems to know more than he's letting on he's kind of a joke of a character with his uh gangsta wannabe yeah it's like he's like uh He's like Norwegian or something like that, but he's yeah. trying to portray himself as like an inner city gangster. Yeah, you know, he's talking he's, in uh, you know gangster style yeah, talk. And yeah, he's using like ebonics and stuff like that. And, uh, but yeah, they uh, he's like currently incarcerated, so they have to go visit him in prison. And they're trying to arrange like a meet with his people on the outside so that they can arrange a trade. And he's just sort of going along with it. We find out more about why he's going along with it later. Yeah, we also see that. Kenzie seems to know every criminal element in the whole whole town. Yeah, he does get a he has a few moments where he plays super cop, which is kind of weird. Uh, it's just like like I get you grew up in the area, but I mean, damn, you seem to, have, you know, at least you know, I don't know how it was, how it is in the other books, but it's like you just seem to be fr- have grown up and been friends with everybody in in Dorchester and. Yeah, he's got a few. He's definitely got a, like a few hookups that he relies heavily on but yeah he's got a connection to just about everybody i don't i, I think uh lahane's trying to portray just like that whole boston area is like uh you know it's a big city but everyone is related it's like oh that's my cousin johnny <laughs> the one time i was hanging out with a friend in boston and he was like pointing to each building and like telling me wh- which ones his cousins lived in <laughs> so, <I was laughs> so maybe he's not far off uh who was the uh kenzie's Patrick's uh, buddy there that they kept bringing in everyone saw the, the oh Bubba Bubba yeah. yeah he was another one of those kind of goofy characters like you know why why is this guy in here and <laughs> you know they, they keep going on about like the old cases where they had serial serial killers and this case where they got pedophiles and drug dealers and this guy just like you know seems to be he's like this guy basically runs the the city almost. Yeah, so Bubba, like in the first three books, it's not actually really just the first two because he winds up going to jail in the third one. But uh, the first two books, like he's just like this absolute wild man, and he factors much more heavily into those the plots of those stories because he's he's like the guy who has all the hookups to the low level crime throughout the city. But he also just like he hates every every person who isn't a dog or Kenzie or Janara, like. He's uh so he's he's this like hard drinking like tough as nails recluse that for some reason likes Kenzie and Gennaro and helps them out uh, regardless of the task. Yeah, he, you know, in this book, he's kind of like a mob boss without a uh, mob behind him. Yeah. But you basically, you know, whatever uh, Kenzie and Gennaro ask for, he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, I'll, I'll help you out, and he'll just go in and cause mayhem and. Yeah, he's he's like a mentally unhinged goon. 
that they come to him whenever they need like someone to be tortured or but, but again, he, to get information. Yeah, but, but, but again, he's like one of the major mob bosses of the, the city. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> so I, like, was, I was actually surprised by his characterization in this. I'm like, what? He owns a bar now? Like he was living in a an abandoned building surrounded by landmines last time I saw him. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess he uh, I guess he got out of jail. He cleaned up, bought it, bought a place, and he just kind of runs it by. Intim- intimidation so like even though it's like a cd dive bar like everyone's always on their best behavior because they don't want to mess with bubba he's he's, he's he's a little cartoonish in his yeah. characterization but you know he said he kind of plays a factor because again you know you get you know at least in this book because no one none of his background other than hey there's this guy bubba he's a badass when they do the, try to do the original s- swap for the uh, the girl, Amanda, he's supposed to be the backup and he's nowhere to be found only to find out that he got cold cocked. Yeah, someone was... mysteriously knocked him out while he was uh, like they arranged this whole uh, like I don't know, pool and Broussard, their underhanded ploy to get the kid back fast gets found out by the head of the CAC and he, you know, they get reprimanded and eventually get kicked out of that department. Yeah, the, the, the whole exchange went to shit because they they found uh, Amanda's teddy bear in a qu- bottom of a quarry in a li- you know lake and they uh, yeah, yeah they, the guns uh, are shot and Pool basically Poole has a heart has attack and two of the uh, mob bosses under Cheese are assassinated. Yeah, the the whole like the whole first half of the book is just like total disaster. Like every plan they make just abs like falls apart like so hard. Uh, but yeah, they uh, it, it ends with um, supposedly Bruce Sard's getting shot at. Yeah, they find one of Amanda's toys in a lake in a quarry, and they assume she is dead because it has this quarry apparently has no bottom to it. And divers look and can't find anything, and they just assume okay, she died. Too bad, so sad. Uh, Angela kind of goes nuts, so in the months. You know, leading or preceding that, and yeah. Before we do, before we get to that part, uh-huh. though, like they have one more meeting with Cheese, uh, where he tells them that they are way off the mark on what they are guessing. Yeah. Uh, but before he says anything else, like the meeting's over and he dies the next day. Yeah, he gets, he gets assa- assassinated, and he supposedly slips on a wet floor and yeah. falls to his death. Yep. Yeah. And it's left unclear if it was Bubba because Bubba was pissed off that he got cold cock and thinks it was Cheese. Or some other, you know, mysterious assailant from this whole shebang. Yeah, but it doesn't make sense because it's established that Cheese and his men know never to mess with Bubba. And if you're going to hit him over the head, you better kill him because he will find you. Yeah, and he he don't care if you are guilty or not. He will just kill you and no one will ever find your body again. Yeah, and then yep. Yeah, so once Cheese dies, uh, there's a bit of a jump ahead. Uh, it cuts into like the winter months. Um, so where Angela's going nuts every time there's a missing kid, she goes bonkers and researches and yeah, she takes it each one very personally. Uh, gets very emotional. <coughs> there's a strain of on the relationship between the two. The, the uh, other couple of suspects that they had been looking for just flat out disappeared. No sign of them, and whenever they do get a rumor, Patrick will try to investigate, but usually find a dead end. And the uh, pool does pool die at that point, or is he uh, still? No, pool uh, pool dies later on. Okay, and that but uh, so they basically yeah. both get him and Broussard get busted down to yeah, like street cops, street cops, and uh, but yeah, pool is uh, pool recovers from his heart attack, but uh, yeah, and yeah, it's just chalked as another mystery. Yeah. Missing kid. Another epic fail by the Massachusetts Police Department. Then, um, yeah, we get into part like part two I- of the se- book is like ten pages, and then part three is the rest of the book, which is where they finally catch a much needed break in the case. So they they're not really investigating anymore because they believe her to be dead, and all their leads are also dead. However, Kenzie is hanging out with Bubba at Bubba's bar. And they decide to go rip off some drug dealers. So they, they show up at some people's house. Uh, there's like this tense scene where, you know, these druggies are pointing guns at them. And Bob is just like casually counting money and putting it in his pockets. And they're too scared to shoot him. But then while they're there, uh, Kenzie notices one of them is wearing a hat. A well, Red Sox well, cap. well, Kenzie recognizes them 
Bubba basically forced Kenzie had to join him because Bubba apparently knows something that, that Kenzie's going to want to know. And when as soon as they get there, Kenzie realizes, hey, these are the pedophiles that we had been looking into before the uh, drug stuff had come up. Yeah, the um, yeah, the one of them is wearing a Red Sox cap that matches the cap of one of the uh, one of the other missing children in the city, and like Kenzie kind of links that, and he meets up with Poole and Broussard and Angela, and they all go back to that place, and uh, that's where things get a little a little crazy. Yeah, they they get this into is, a massive yeah. shootout. Yeah, this is where yeah, I mean, there's been some graphic stuff up leading up to it. This is where it goes from uh, it, 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 I don't know, this next like this next kind of like side quest that they go on kind of makes sh- make sure you're not reading a cozy mystery because there's some really really gruesome uh, descriptions and acts of violence in it. Yeah, basically we find out that these three had been torturing and doing terrible things to several children and yeah the uh, Kenzie is like getting chased around by one of the ladies who's you know hunting him down with a shotgun and he barricades himself in a room. And then uh, finds one of the missing children, like all like cut up and dead in a bathtub. Yeah, yeah mutilated, and one of the uh, perverts is lying there, bleeding out. And Kenzie hurries him along, and yeah, Ken- yeah Kenzie just flat out like, like executes him, bullet to the back of the head. Which and then, um, yeah, also like Broussard. Broussard like, takes out the woman, yeah, and he'd been crawling through the basement, and he finds uh, two skeletons of children, uh, and he also executes one of the people who's uh, you know unarmed at that point so yeah it was uh pretty terrible but it's enough to get the case re restarted for amanda and and also uh pool gets shot during that that's where he dies yeah, that's where he, he gets dies. shot and he dies later in the hospital the big thing about that scene like it's almost like it doesn't fit with the rest of the story just because it's like a side quest but it also sets up what happens next where it's just kind of the downfall for brassard there because yeah, because he like, because it, it, because they, they he had it dead to rights to the, the the crime he did commit <clears throat> but then basically he got cocky and said hey we can take out these guys but it's going to reawaken this other case and yeah because he has a drunken conversation that like the following night with kenzie because they're both kind of trying to work through the trauma that they just witnessed and uh they set up you know what's the moral quandary of the book which we've already discussed like what's right versus what is expected of you in the society and they don't always correlate but he also lets slip that like one of the uh police informants that was giving some of the information earlier in the book is actually one of broussard's police informants which they kept hidden and that kind of tweak something in Kenzie's brain where he wants to look further into Broussard because why is this guy I'm working closely with not being 100% honest with me? And he starts finding out really fast some disturbing stuff. Yeah, he starts following him around realizing that he doesn't live in town. He's got this girlfriend or wife that doesn't quite fit fit the picture. She uh, was a prostitute. Uh, that Broussard decided to start dating when uh, he was in Vice and kind of got him kicked off of Vice. And they had this kid that there's no real record of. And Yeah, it's, uh, it's established that Broussard and his wife can't have children, and yet Kenzie shows up at Broussard's house and there's a child there that's clearly being raised as yeah. their child. Yeah, and we also now you know get Broussard's threatening Kenzie you know, inviting him into a uh, police football game, and basically the whole uh, CAC and Vice Department threatened to kill Kenzie if he continues investigating. Yeah, and the uh, Homicide Department would be like, dude, you got messed up with the wrong group of people there. They're all fucking nuts. Yeah, uh, Devin and Oscar, who uh, are also their character, like his main contacts in the police department, uh, they both warn him, like, do not fuck with Broussard. He will kill you. He's got a dark side that he's willing to protect. Yeah, and that was another thing for me, not having read the other books. You know, like, who are these other cops all of a sudden that were being introduced to? There's, there wasn't a lot of backstory with that. And it felt like, you know, at, you know, at times, especially when Kenzie uh, later, a little bit later goes to one of their houses and he's just drinking alone and then there's a third cop brought in and it's like... You know, it got, got kind of confusing for me. It's like I know none of these cops. They came in late. I'm assuming they were in the previous books. 
Yeah, Devin and Oscar in the previous books, they factor in heavy. They're 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 very side characters in this. Yeah. Uh, similar to Bubba, Bubba was. Uh, I feel like Bubba was also underused in this one. Uh, I keep. I'm gonna be talking a lot of smack about this book. I liked it, but <laughs> it has a uh, had some holes that I had a problem with. Speaking of which, let's go to probably what's the biggest stretch in this entire story is how they break this case open, uh, because they're just having a conversation at a restaurant with someone. And Kenzie is watching a UPS driver drop off packages, and he realized Lionel is a UPS driver, and Lionel has a criminal record, which UPS does not hire people with criminal records. So how's Lionel working for UPS in that case? And then, like, he stretches that, like, he pulls on that elastic band. I don't know how it doesn't snap, because he gets from that realization to realizing that it was the arresting officer was Broussard who kept it off the books and so like it was never an official felony and yada yada and like Broussard was keeping tabs on Lionel and then uh, they worked up some cockamamie scheme to kidnap Amanda from Helene to get a, Amanda out of a neglectful situation so it was a, a little wild leap of logic there that I was I was reading and I'm like that's how that's how it happens Come on, guys. Yeah. And then on top of it, we get another character introduced here. The uh, Justice Department special agent comes in. Oh yeah, he, he doesn't. A, uh, he doesn't fare well. Yeah, he, uh, but so basically, the the feds are getting involved. Uh, in the uh, the shootout with the perverts, uh, Angela had also been shot up. So oh, yeah, she broke her leg or something. Yeah, uh, Kenzie broke her leg, uh, trying to save her. So there's a oh, whole. Angela's leg was broken. Kenzie's yeah. was. Yeah, Did but I was gonna say that Kenzie broke, you know, broke it trying to save her. Oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Because he ta- basically tackled her, so mm-hmm. so she wanted to get shot. But that because he hurt her, that's now bringing in more strain into their relationship on already a st- stressful situation. But so the special agent comes in and he's being, you know, they, he comes in right when they find out Poole died in the hospital, and Kenzie's getting worried because Broussard's really going nut nut so and saying yeah you're you're gonna die you're gonna die and uh the special agent comes and says i got your get out of jail free card but it's gonna cost you yeah and then they uh they pull in lionel like to a just a small restaurant a little, yeah. little diner bar thing yeah and they're uh they're trying to grill him trying to get him to spill some info he tells them a certain amount but he refuses to tell like now they get it out of him that yeah he is the one who took amanda Especially after a, a moment when, uh, or an event when um, Helene left Amanda on the beach for an entire day, and she got like third degree sunburns all over her body, and then like she refused to administer care beyond uh, that uh, Irish skin. I'm yeah. telling you. Oh yeah, it's fair Irish skin, man. Uh, but yeah, so they they had worked up a plan to kidnap her and kind of do what Broussard has done with. Uh, the child that he's raising is like he found a child that was being neglected yeah, yeah, near we, death. We, and yeah, we basically it. eventually find out that there's this bizarre that started up this whole scheme of kidnapping unwanted children and finding people that can't have children for whatever reason and raising them as their own. Yeah, that was a that was the whole thing. And like during the uh, diner scene, like two armed men with guns come in and uh, they're trying to make it look like uh, Lionel was trying to be a hero and stop a robbery. Uh, However, like I don't know, it backfires on them because. And, and again, it was one of those you know kind of stretches. Like, why do this? They would have been, you know, you would have had so many better ways to drop Lionel and not have a case against you than running into here with a Fed and two uh, two dicks that are gonna be like, hey, we're gonna, you know, we know who you are. Yeah, but uh, yeah, in the end. Uh, there's an ensuing gunfight, and uh, Angela shoots and mortally wounds. Uh, she kills one guy and mortally no, she the, the, the she special kills agent kills one of the guys, and then Angela shoots and mortally wounds an, uh, another one who turns out to be Broussard. Uh, and, and again, they just you know because that you know even if Broussard hadn't been mortally wounded, the fact that they you know found out that it was one of his former partners that was the other guy is like okay, come on here, you know. It's a little silly. It starts. It's, it, I don't know. It gets ridiculous. But um, yeah, like Broussard. It's the nineties, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. Broussard, Broussard, like escapes from there. But Kenzie tracks him down to the roof of a building, and they have like one last heart to heart. And you can tell there's some like, even though like 
Broussard just tried to kill him. He's kill- clearly killed other people to cover his tracks. Uh, there's some s- mutual respect between the two uh, people. And uh, Broussard kind of like lets slip that there's a, a lot of, like the CAC has been doing this for a little while now, like taking children and putting them in safer homes because uh, the U.S. government almost always sides with the parents, especially mothers, and uh, sometimes, you know, what what's this, you know what's expected of you isn't uh, always what's in the best interest of the people that you're serving. So, so one question I had in here through all this, you know, especially when the the feds showed up, the f- one fed was, where's the t- internal affairs? You would have thought, you know, when you started getting feds involved and even, you know, before when you had the major shootout, you'd have had someone from internal affairs sniffing around at the whole thing. Like, hey, something smells fishy here. Yeah, this was a massive, massive, like, scandal, uh, an oversight by the police department. Yeah, I mean, especially when you find out that the the head of the whole uh, CAC unit is... Yeah, he's the primary kidnapper. Yeah, yeah, and and he's it, he's had like, I don't know, he's in charge of this case, and he's had this child the entire time, and this is a case where a ton of people have died. Uh, he himself right. has orchestrated murders, and like that whole scene in the quarry where they believe the kid is dead, that was all orchestrated by him. Yeah, I said, you know, I you know, said, yeah, they didn't know that at the time, but. At what point would internal affairs normally be in, involved in this? And you, know, you, you watch most cop dramas on TV or read you know, a lot of these books. Internal affairs is usually mentioned at some point, and here it was nothing. It's like, yeah, like it, and this is a fairly big de- police department. If you got a uh, CAC unit and vice and, narco- you know, and uh, narcotics and hom- homicide and enough people to fill out two football teams. Yeah, like uh, there's – there are two cops who essentially like uh, it wasn't their intent to steal it, but they stole two hundred thousand dollars of police evidence, and there was no investigation. They just got demoted and swept under the rug. Yeah, so I said like, it, it could have probably fallen apart there when they attempted to do that. But yeah, they we find out that uh, the head of the chi- uh, ch- uh, crimes against children de- department of the police, uh, Jack Doyle and his wife are keeping Amanda. Amanda I- with them is now safe and happy and enjoying w- the wonderful life of a five-year-old. Yeah, and... And the, they uh, come they, they, in, the, and they ruin the shit out of yeah, that. Yeah, the, the, the homicide detectives go in, and Angela and Patrick are there, and Angela gets very pissed off, and she she's the one that kind of says, you know, the girl is finally happy. She was dead inside with Helen and you know yeah despite everything that's happened to them like she's got a bum leg and she's you know witnessed people she likes dying she still sees that kid happy and she's willing to look the other way for the sake of the child and then Patrick says well the law is the law and we can't stop it and we got two police officers with us that can't turn their backs on us otherwise they're culpable and just as guilty to this crime and the continuing crimes that this department has been committing. Yep. A lot of, there's been a lot of blood spilled to keep this kid safe and it's not something that anyone can look away from anymore. So that, that kind of ruins is Patrick's and Angela's relationship and Angela flat out leaves him over, uh, him allowing the two cops to do their job. And it sounds like, it sounds like these two cops are very or relatively, clean cops that they they're maybe not white knights but they're they're gonna do what what is required of them yeah they'll do the right thing um even if the right thing isn't one that makes it feel good like but um yeah the uh yeah it's the scene where like they show like the kid getting taken away from them and they're just like you know the guy and his wife are just sitting there like broken and then like it kind of like it's it's very it's very moving to see that happen, like I, and I've never seen the movie, but I imagine they probably did that all in slow motion, when the, you know the kid's getting picked up and carried away while she's screaming. Yeah, and, and then uh, she gets brought back to Helen and goes back to the way it was, except now Lionel's in 
jail also. Yeah. Lionel's in jail. Jack Doyle goes to jail. His wife goes to jail. And, you know, poor Amanda is back into her old shell of a broken child and in front yep. of a TV. And yep. Patrick decides to pay them a visit. Yep, she's sitting in front of a TV. Helene is going out again, leaving her kid behind. Uh, supposedly with a babysitter, but she hasn't really confirmed it yet. But she's going probably going out regardless. And yep. um, yeah, it's yeah, uh, just another child uh, ruined in the nineties. Yeah, the the mother hasn't changed, and doing the right thing has caused a lot of harm. And it just at the book ends with Patrick sitting on a swing set, a place where he had stopped a serial killer once before. And he's just reflecting on everything that's happened. Well, actually, the book as it goes back to our little town in Texas. And yep. We get one final epilogue, a quick little page, checking back in with the mystery woman from the beginning who of the book. We find out is Rachel. and Rachel, who is Broussard's uh, wife. Yeah. And she's now hiding out in Texas under a fake name with the child that's not technically hers. But she is willing to do anything for that child. It kind of gives like that final like that dichotomy of you know what it's like for the people that do get away with it. Like, are they happy? Are they content with their decisions? And I get the uh, impression that you know she's living with a lot of guilt, but she's also willing to endure a lot because she has a child that loves her, and she loves that child. So yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts on the book, Alex? Uh, I think it's excellent. It's well written, um, even though it's set, you know, in the '90s. Over like I think this book's like 25 years old at this point. Um, it's uh, it still holds it's ancient. up. Ancient. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's got the data references. Are they have to find a payphone and cell phones aren't really like nobody's got one in their pockets or anything like that. But I, I think, think they do have some car phones. Yeah, there might book. be some car phones. <laughs> but yeah, overall, it's uh, I think it still holds up on an emotional aspect. Uh, a lot of people's emotions and feelings, like, you know, there's different, you know, paradigm shifts and ways of thinking. But I think the emotions that we get here and the thoughts and the moral quandaries that we're reading about here, they all still hold up very well. And they're things that people still debate to this day. Yeah, I thought the book was good overall. Uh, I thought it was a little long and over uh, convoluted in some areas. Yeah, I think it, as far as being over long, it does take a little while to get started. I think they, I think they always knew they were going to take the case. They just they took you know seventy pages for them to be like, all right, fine, we'll do yeah, it. Yeah, so by, by, by the time by the time you get to the you know, get to the uh, the first shootout there on the uh, in the quarry, it's just like, man, you know, it, we're we're only halfway through and. You, you know, say it was such a climatic thing, and then it's like, oh, we got a whole 200 pages to go. Okay, you know, we're 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 not even close yet. Yeah, especially after the the slow burn, initial slow burn, and then he's like, oh, we got another slow burn coming here. Yeah, there's but, a couple of slow sections, but yeah, yeah. I feel like I feel like the second half reads way faster than the yeah, first half. Yeah, the second half uh, does uh, because there's way more action, and it's much more like you finally start figuring out what's actually going on yeah and, and again you know it's because uh, the, the first yeah. half is just this giant red herring that's been like we're all getting duped here yeah yeah sorry i keep interrupting you it's very professional of me Sh- should i can i continue now oh go on as i said this book is v- very 90s and not just because of the, the, the references and whatnot but just the way that uh caught procedurals were portrayed back then you know now i don't know if it's necessarily more accurate but we definitely have a different standard of what our cop dramas on tv and in books are going to look like and this is just very um different you know i said you know from a different era almost and like you know the, the lack of internal affairs and other uh, checkups and district attorneys and all that stuff you know most of the stuff would be a lot more detailed in that other stuff yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely more of like a Hollywood style version of what the police and private investigators do. Which is uh, why they made a Hollywood movie out of it. That's probably what it is. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like I don't know. You there's it's uh, a lot of things happen in this book that clearly land it in, as a uh, work of fiction. 
um, and not so, just so because. So, what would you rate the book, Alex? So, uh, well, I gave it. I think I gave it five stars. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Goodreads allowed me to do half star ratings. I go four and a half, just because. Yeah, there are just some things that are like, even though it's fiction, and you got to have that kind of suspension of disbelief. Uh, it's still like, how did you get there f- from here? Like, like, like I was w- when we were talking about the uh, how he uncovers everything. It's just like the most coincidental thing then it just like clicks for him uh and like the entire story falls into place just because he's seeing a ups driver drop off packages all of a sudden (laughs) it's uh all of a sudden the case is broken wide open and he like just in that one conversation solves everything in its entirety almost um so you know here we go to my my questions here i guess you know uh, one of the ones was like why was Cheese Ullman uh, so willing to cooperate with Kenzie and uh, Gennaro? It, that, that was one of those things that just kind of, you know, seemed off in the story. You know, what's this big time gangster doing talking to a couple of dicks? It, granted, you know, I, I get they were childhood friends, sort of, kind of. Basically, Patrick didn't make fun of the Cheese when he was young and gawky and awkward. Yeah, I mean, Cheese doesn't really give them a whole lot to work with because uh, it's revealed that he's helping blackmail Broussard because one of his guys saw Broussard and Lionel do the, you know, take Amanda out of the house. So I think he's more being coy than anything yeah. and kind of messing with them. But he also, I think, uh, Patrick, people just seem to like him for some reason. And want like the whole thing with Bubba, like it makes yeah. no sense why they like Kenzie. You know, he's just a sarcastic a hole from Dorchester. But yeah, he seems to get help from a lot of CD people that you know probably would benefit from not talking to him. Hey, and uh, what are your thoughts, Alex, on Lionel? Uh, do you think his decision was morally just? Is there uh, what is the difference between legality and morality in this case? Do you think? He should have done it or he sh- should have found a different way. I mean, his justifications are, are there. Like, I think everyone knows that, that you know, that guy or there's, you know, there's always that one situation where you really wish you could step in and get that kid out of that situation. And I think he thought he was doing the right thing. I think he got in way over his head. I'd say he out of, you know, all the people who committed the act he's probably the most innocent because he was just trying to help out a family member from a really shitty situation whereas the method he went about doing it where he's you know getting police officers to form this entire criminal enterprise to get her out i think that's what really undid him in the end and like talking about like when they're arresting jack doyle and broussard like broussard dying like they killed people they uh, and they're, they're no different from, from any other yeah. gangster on the they, street. Yeah, they were going to kill Lionel to cover up their story. They were going to kill Patrick. Yeah, and a Fed. Yeah, so they, you know, like I think Bruce, uh, like Broussard's clearly the main antagonist. I yeah. think Lionel just he got he wound up in a situation where he thought he was doing the right thing, and it wound up not being the right way to do it. I think you know Lionel, you know, was just flat out wrong. I mean. Yeah, it's a family member. You want to help them any way you can. But there's better ways to do it than that. They're not as, quote-unquote, easy. Yeah, I mean, the family court is uh, uh, you don't, has you, been a nightmare. But you don't you don't even have to go that route, necessarily. I mean, you got a drug addict sister that it wouldn't take much just to get her thrown in jail. Oh, I guess we're going to take the kid for a while. Oh, she's just going to disappear for a week at a time? Hey, you know, Helen, why don't you just drop Amanda off here and pick her up when you're uh when you're done doing whatever the fuck you're doing and just raise her like your pseudo child you know so you don't have to make it this whole just get the man to the hell out of there so i said there, there are better ways to do it yeah he definitely took a more extreme route than than i would have but yeah he's a uh, like you can you can see his justification it's just it's, it's not the right way to do it and angie do you believe that she condones what Bassard and lionel ended up doing or that you know for for their justifications uh do you think because she would have let amanda stay with doyle that she is kind of like bassard in that aspect of you know maybe not just the 
killing to keep the secret, but you know, Hey, the child's happy. Let's keep it as it is and let these essentially murderers get away with it. Yeah. I don't, it's weird because I don't think she like condones what happened, but she saw that child being happy and she realized that's really the only chat chance that cha- kid is going to have to have a happy life so i think she got kind of caught up in that in that dilemma and it's you know it's a lot seeing you know all that potential a child has and if we allow this uh, atrocity to go unchecked that child might have a happy life and i think i think she i don't know if she'll come around in future books but i think for you know just like that pure just uh, paternal or maternal instinct uh i think she just got sucked into that with the standoff at the end between angie and patrick who would you side with oh gosh uh well um i think i ended up uh, mom and dad are divorcing who are you gonna live with alex <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. um yeah they're not getting divorced just in case they're listening uh, <laughs> yeah i think i ended up siding with with kenzie on this one like it's it's a really tough decision it's a rock and a hard place situation there's no way you're gonna come out of it smelling like a rose you're gonna be the bad guy you're gonna have to do something evil whether it's abiding by the law and putting a child in a dangerous situation or breaking the law and letting killers get away with something like it's it's a no-win situation but in, in the end you got to do what society has decided is the right thing to do and that means putting the child with the mother and you got to just wait for the next opportunity where to present itself where you can make a case that this this person should not be a parent yeah i definitely agreed uh with with patrick you know you got people that are you know proven they're willing to kill just to keep their secret versus you know a mother that well neglectful uh, still does the bare minimum of her job. So, you know, as the, bi- the pile, the bodies pile up, you know, at what point, how many more lives have to get ruined to, yeah, well, to save this one yeah. girl's life? Well, I think the problem is, yeah, she doesn't do the bare minimum of her job. Like she's almost gotten her kid killed many, many times. Well, she's, she's doing the, she's, she's doing the bare minimum. She's, she's, she's kept her alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know. I know. Like as a parent, you can, uh, you can screw up quite a bit. And, you know, still wake up in the morning and, like, the, your kid's still going to love you. But I don't I don't see that happening with Helene and mm-hmm. Amanda. I mean, there's a good chance the kid's going to live. I don't know what the quality of life's going to be. Mm-hmm. But um, I'd just say, like, take, take the gamble. Either Helene's going to learn something and is going to change as a person or she's not. Or, or Amanda's going to grow up fast and, yeah. you know, and figure not, things you, out on yeah. her own and you hopefully pull herself Another chance to get Amanda out of there. Yeah. So final thesis question kind of built off of that. What would you do in Patrick's shoes or Angie's or Doyle and Bessard's shoes? I would not take the case. You would not take the case if yeah. you're any of them? <laughs> yeah. I really like that dilemma. I think the amount of whole, like awful, awful things that they did to keep their secret uh, really just kind of drove them to the point of zero credibility. I, w- I would probably say like, always abide by the law and just in case you know the government just in case the cops are listening i would never (laughs) kidnap a child to raise it as my own i promise i will never do that um i can see why someone would want to do that and like it's you know it's tempting like i work with children like i see the effects of neglect and abuse what it has on people and you know you want to help and you want to do right by the kid and the lives of adults don't matter as much as the life of a child when a, you know there's a, a young person in danger and I, th- I think you can make an argument on Broussard's kid the one that, that him and Rachel are raising that one actually almost kind of did work out like yeah you could see that that being okay because the kid is literally you know an infant that was abandoned in a uh, in a crack house. In a crack house, and it would have literally died if he didn't hadn't taken it and basically raised it as his. Because it, you know, even if they got into the system, there's so many cracks in that system, especially back then. You know, even now that Fint's chance of surviving weeks or months is so small. 
Uh, also, they're like, at what point do we get to draw that line? Like, when do we get to impose our will on other people? Like, that's why we have the laws. Like, we don't have that yeah, right I mean, it's to it's decide. But, you know, you know, like, you know, you could see that line being crossed with Broussard when he went from this infant literally has nobody to, oh, we're going to take this child away from a mother, you know, against her will. Yeah, and then, like, you can there's this huge dichotomy between those two kids because, like, he took that child and the parents never tried to find her or really? find him. Uh, Helene's kid gets taken and she's on the news screaming her head off. Yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, you know, part of me too felt that Angie's uh, logic when you know, this whole thing was going on was a bit off because it, you know it's a lot of it was how much she wanted to have a child herself and how could she say, "Hey, I want this child taken away from this mother because they're a bad mother," but not think, you know, what would happen if someone took my child because they thought I was a bad mother because I work as a dick, you know, as a you know, private investigator doing these dangerous cases and therefore exposing this kid to possible dangerous elements. Yeah, I mean, she swears, she smokes, she drinks heavily. She's had uh, she's had a shady past with you know. Just about, I mean, so not, not even just that, but just just the and fact that she's yeah. dealing with crim- criminals yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah. She works. Yeah, she's got friends in low places. Mm-hmm. She's you know regularly putting her own life in danger, endangering the lives of those around her. So yeah, you could arg- make an argument that like if Kenzie and Gennaro had a kid, like are they going to be fit parents? Yeah. So. There is Gone Baby Gone. Do you have any other comments, Alex? Yeah, it's a, it's a good book. Good good last comment, Alex. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I see you put a lot of effort and thought into that one. Yeah, I can't recommend Dennis Lehane books enough. As as wild as uh, as this book got towards the end, on reflection, I'm like, oh, that was silly. But reading it, I was like, wow, like really sucked in. And so he does a good job just with his plotting and his pacing. And... Um, it's a lot more like in depth characterizations as well. Like, and we've read a couple of thrillers now, like from Agatha Christie, from Agatha Christie and uh, Elena Urquhart, and uh, I think this is like we're, we're not supposed to mention that one anymore, I, Alex. Yeah, we, we you have uh, you have uh, people that tell us we that we t- we mention it too often. We don't <laughs> talk about Urquhart, uh, <laughs> but yeah. But uh, I think as far as uh, detective novels with really good character development and plotting and just general storytelling abilities. I think Lehane is like the perfect combination of all of that and his style of storytelling. So I enjoy his books quite a bit. Okay. Yeah. Did you, did you have closing thoughts? Oh, I've already said all my thoughts. Okay. If you were ever listening instead of just interrupting, you would have heard them. I'm Thank sorry. You did you say something? <laughs> all right. Well, that means We've got we've got a we got a nail in this one. Yep. What is our next story for next time on our next episode, Joe? It's going to be a doozy. It's going to make some people laugh and just piss off a whole hell of a segment of a uh, the population. It is called Lamb. It is by Christopher Moore and it's about Jesus Christ and his childhood friend Biff. And I will leave it at there at that other than it's probably one of my all-time favorite books probably easily top three favorite books in that that category and yeah this is a this is one of the books that we've actually both read uh before i don't remember a damn thing about it so i'm oh, yeah. excited to read it again yeah, it is it is absolutely hilarious it's the lost years of christ told in a very funny fashion so i hope you guys enjoy that and uh with that we will close out here. Uh, we have an email. You can get a hold of us at kendallbookworms at gmail.com if you have any comments or recommendations. Uh, we also have an Instagram, Kendall, at kendallbookworms. You can DM us there also or just follow and like what we do on that. We have a Facebook page now, Kendall Ooh, Bookworms. Yeah, we're, we're going big time here. We have a podcast website through Podbean at Kendall Bookworms through them. Uh, We are on all uh, podcast listening apps, so please tell your friends about us. Tell tell them to listen to us because that's the best way to get our name out there, and we want more people to listen to us so that we can someday 
let Alex have to retire from his job and just be a podcaster full time. Sounds yeah. great. Yeah. This introverted bookworm. Yeah. He's, loves talking all the time. So, so yeah. It's a, we got anything else there, Alex? Did I miss anything? Uh, that's all I got. Okay. So if you're all set. I'm all set. Well, that means that is the end of our show. And until next time, I'm Alex. And I'm Joe. And this has been Bookworms. <laughs>